of payments, allegedly, un unless he had been the one who was able to make those decisions that had such a big impact that it was worth it to those businesses um, mm -hmm. to potentially pay those bribes. So, right, it's indicative of a broken system. And I think that reality has been staring the legislature in the face for a number of years now. I think at the time of Correa's arrest, I mean, even at the U.S. attorney uh, for Massachusetts at the time, Andrew Mellon, come out and say that the system was, you know, ripe for this type of corruption. And I think that since then, we've had ample documentation that this is not going well and not being uh, you know, carried out in a fair or logical way. And I don't know what the solution to that is, but it does seem very obvious that there's an issue here. And I, um, I, I think there's growing impatience among people about the legislature's failure to, uh, so far, uh, to deal with it. Of course, in April, we had 420. For the first time, we were not completely locked down. Um, there was some events, sort of spaced out, masked events happening in Boston at the time. So, you know, it wasn't the best 420 in the world, but we did have record sales in Boston this year. And the state has actually topped $2 billion in revenue. Uh, so, you know, those are both signs from the 420 sales and from the year, the yearly sales. They, they are signs that the, you know, the growth of the market, it's, it's moving in the right direction. We've seen a lot of companies open up over this year as well. So I think the sales record on 420, it's a good marker for how the industry is growing, do you think? Yeah, absolutely. The industry is getting a lot bigger. The Cannabis Control Commission has definitely picked up its pace of licensing over the past couple of years. So that pipeline just feels a little wider. It feels like, you know, almost every week, every other week, they're sending off a flurry of tweets uh, telling us which companies are the latest to have been approved to actually open for business. Um, and, you know, when we did that five year anniversary story uh, a month or so ago that you had mentioned, one of my colleagues made a little animated map. And you can watch all the different marijuana facilities sort of it's pop so up cool. on the map of Massachusetts. Oh my God, I stared at that thing. So <laughs> I hit a, uh, I hit a blunt so and cool. I stared at that and I was like, oh, this I is didn't, amazing. I didn't say that just for the record. But <laughs> I'm glad that you enjoyed it. That map, you can see it, right? You can see the acceleration in those dots, you know, exploding all over the map, right? At first it's a yeah. trickle, but now that pace is really picked up. Now that said, um, I don't think the industry has reached anywhere close to its full maturity. I think we're going to see you know, a lot more retail still to come. And I think that there's going to need to be a, a still a rather large increase in supply to feed, mm. so to speak, uh, all those stores. Um, I think one of the reasons that we're seeing the persistence of such high prices at dispensaries in Massachusetts uh, is fundamentally just an issue of supply. There's a relatively small handful of mostly you know, vertically integrated companies that are producing the bulk of the flour uh, that's available at wholesale right now. Mm. And, uh, you know, if you are the owner of an independent retail store that doesn't grow your own cannabis, your options for which brands you can carry on your shelves are um, really quite limited. And uh, by the time you add a markup to that, that you know, doesn't add up to a very impressive market for the consumer. So I just hear all the time from people about how frustrated they are with the poor selection uh, at Massachusetts marijuana stores and also the high prices. And um, so and those, the market those... is growing, but, you know, not maybe as large as, as some consumers would like to see it grow. Definitely. And and those high prices, they still drive a lot of people to the underground market. Uh, one of your reports said 68 percent of sales are estimated to be still on the underground market. That's an in incredibly high number. Is it, do you put that down to the prices? I, I think prices are a big factor in it. I also don't. Um, you know, I don't know that I have a ton, a ton of confidence in that being like the exact figure. I think it's probably about a year old, too. So we've had a lot of stores open since then. And, and the prices have come down a little, a little, not a lot, maybe mm -hmm. five to 10 percent since the, um, you know, dispensaries first opened. So I think that, you know, again, the increasing competition, the prices coming down, it will draw more people into the legal market. So I don't know. Is it 68 percent today? It's probably not mm, quite that bad. But yes, price is a huge factor in that. But I also think that there's consumers who are willing to pay for the reassurance that the product has been tested and mm -hmm. produced by somebody licensed and reputable who, you know, didn't say, oh, crud, there's a bunch of bugs on my cannabis at the last second before harvest and just spray it down with whatever <laughs> pesticide in their closet in Alston. Yeah. Um, you know, so I, I don't know. You're speaking I, I from experience there, Dan. <laughs> I, I've, I've, I've seen some places in Austin that, you know, 
<laughs> I, I, there's, I've got some stories from my previous. Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that another we'll time. <laughs> so this year we have seen a huge uptick, as you were saying, in the licensing process. We have gone from at the beginning of the year, we had 97 retailers and now we've got 176. So, you know, that's almost 100 percent increase in the number of retailers that we have across Massachusetts. That's an up of 79. We've also seen a slight uptick in the number of product manufacturers at the beginning of the year. That cool little map that your colleague did said that we had 38 product manufacturers. And at the end of the year, we have 53. So we've gone up by 15. It's a respectable number, I think, for manufacturers. Mm -hmm. um, and for cultivators, we've gone from 44 at the beginning of the year to 60 at the end of the year. So that's been an increase of 16 cultivators. And we've also had an addition of four independent testing labs. We initially just at the beginning of the year had three in the whole state, and now we have seven. It's been a pretty busy year in Massachusetts. That's a, also, and that's a surprisingly big deal about the labs, by the way, because that um, can become a real bottleneck on yeah. production because all cannabis has to be tested and uh, it doesn't matter how fast you can grow it and harvest it and do all that kind of stuff. But if it's just stuck there waiting for the lab to get around to uh, testing it and you're in line behind a bunch of other folks who sent their samples in first, you know, you're out of luck. And so I think that's something that the growers are definitely celebrating. But, you know, as you read those numbers, really that increase in the number of cultivators is not going to cut it. That's not, mm. uh, that's not really a, such a huge increase. And also I think it's important to continue asking, and I'm sure we'll talk more about this, but uh, you know, who's getting these licenses, who's mm -hmm. being able you know, to open the business. Yeah, absolutely. And there's been two micro businesses open, um, which I am assuming are the delivery licenses that started this year. Is that right? This Some year? micro businesses are able to deliver. I think, though, that new micro businesses opening, those are usually either small growers or small processors. So that mm. somebody who makes uh, edibles or grows a very small canopy of uh, marijuana. Gotcha, um, yeah. so that and they have to be locally owned that's the criteria but right. yes, some 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 of them can deliver too and in june we did get our first recreational pot delivery which was by freshly baked and we have spoken to philip smith from freshly baked so we've got an old episode with him if oh, you nice. want to go check you, that have you, out have you done that have you used delivery yet I, I haven't not here that. no i've not tried okay. it here i i tried it in california when i lived there all the time but i actually like to go in and discuss my selection with somebody so i don't just want to order it and have it delivered it's i don't know it's so not you like the personal interaction I, yeah, I it, yeah it's not really um such a novelty to me to get it dropped off like i live five minutes from a dispensary but i do understand it if you don't live anywhere nearby well right and not only if you don't live nearby but unfortunately uh you know in municipalities in massachusetts that have banned marijuana stores brick and mortar stores you are also not able to get recreational delivery in those oh, towns so goodness. you're sort of double double ding there Oh, um, of course. Yeah, I haven't I haven't tried the delivery myself either. Um, I did see I think some we'll, billboards. We'll see it, though. Oh yeah. yeah, I was just gonna say, I mean, like you were saying, it's sort of ubiquitous in California these days. And I think yeah. that eventually we'll get there. I noticed just the other day I was pumping gas in uh, Somerville and one of the little ads came on next to the gas pump on the little <laughs> screen and it's for cannabis delivery platforms. Oh so wow. It's it's coming. Times are changing. Oh my yep. gosh. Speaking of which July was also a really big time for cannabis news in sports because that was when runner Shikari Richardson was banned from the Olympics. Um, this story really made waves, even though she wasn't from Massachusetts. It made waves here with a lot of athletes, advocates, um, and, and we saw a lot of athletes come out not long afterwards saying, you know, cannabis and CBD has helped me through a lot of stuff. Um, notably here in Massachusetts was Paul Pierce, who was from the Celtics, who said that he has been using it for decades. That was a big piece that you wrote on, on the impact that Shikari Richardson had here in Mass. Yeah, that was such an interesting episode in, in the mix of this year's news that like something I didn't really expect to, uh, you know, to have to cover. And such a, uh, an interesting kind of mixed reaction. I think some folks sort of saying, well, she deserved to get kicked out, basically, because, you know, she knew the rules, right or wrong, you know, sure. I, I got a lot of comments, a lot of emails from people sort of saying, you know, I don't have a problem with marijuana being illegal, but, you know, she knew that she wasn't supposed to use it and she did, and so shame on her, I think that's a little simplistic uh, mm -hmm. in terms of how to view it. And I think it's especially simplistic in light of the fact that she, you know, I think had some really substantial family trauma you know, just yeah. around that time. And it, it seemed like a very, to me, uh, 
you know, the instinct to use a little cannabis in that situation was uh, frankly relatable. And I, it seemed like a perfectly, you know, reasonable and rational thing to do that didn't, uh, as far as I know, endanger anybody else or you know, endanger her health or anything like that. And so the, the sanction of, you know, having a lifelong dream, you know, that you work for every second of the, of the day, you know, I mean, you don't get to the Olympics by um, being casual and having you know, yeah. you take care of your body, things like that, right? So and it I comes around every four years. Uh, I assume if Shakari Richardson, uh, you know, has incorporated cannabis into her routine, it's it's working with whatever, <laughs> you know, she's doing athletically yeah. because right. she's going to be in the Olympics, right? So that was the other half of the reaction was folks sort of agreeing that, um, you know, the rest of us had no right to tell her what to ingest mm -hmm. or, or uh, you know, how to treat her, her pain. So definitely a, a, a complicated chapter there. But I think if anything good came out of it, I do think that now the sports authorities are going to take a closer look at those rules and whether they're really warranted, you know, serving any good. Um, I think mm -hmm. that the IOC and, you know, organizations like that are, are sort of saying, this wasn't, this, this wasn't, these weren't the headlines we were hoping to have, you know, let's, let's take another look at these rules around cannabis. Maybe we can relax some of that a little bit because it's, you know, it's not like steroids or something. So I, yeah. I'm, I'm curious to see where that conversation goes. I am too. And uh, just uh, a few episodes ago, we had a really interesting conversation with Rachel Rapineau, uh, former soccer athlete, and she uh, is just a huge advocate of CBD. And we had an interesting conversation about how the different uh, sports leagues treat cannabis and, and that Major League Baseball doesn't care and that NFL sort of has a small testing period and, and how it's just differently treated by by different sports bodies around the world and how it really impacts athletes as humans and that we often forget that that's what they are and we use them a lot of the time as just entertainment but that we have to you know also think of them and as as fellow people in our society <laughs> let them smoke weed right yeah and again i think the major sports leagues like you said they've really backed down from some of the more aggressive testing policies around cannabis and i think that's essentially that. That's not happening so much in response to changes in the law, in my opinion. That's happening in response to changes in public opinion yeah. and how much of a "quote unquote" scandal it would be uh, if somebody, one of the teams, used cannabis. And I think their calculation was just that, yeah, no one really cares anymore. And it was really <laughs> interesting to you know, interview Paul Pierce earlier this year and to hear about how you know he uh, had this really traumatizing experience where he was stabbed almost to death in a nightclub. Um, it was really, really seriously wounded and also was really seriously humiliated in public right that he, the way that it was portrayed at the time was mm. you know, you're you're sort of this like you know thuggy hood hood guy hanging around in nightclubs where you shouldn't be come on like focus on basketball there was a lot of race yeah. you know racist thinking tied up i think in how that was presented at the time and and he was scared he thought he was going to be attacked again right yeah it's interesting to watch how these uh how these stories how these news stories really push the conversation forward in our culture and, and make certain things seem more acceptable and, and allow for conversations to happen in families and minds to change. All right, we are almost halfway through. Oh, no, we're more than halfway through the year. We're on to August. In August, the Boston City Council overhauled the licensing process. What changed exactly? Right, so uh, the... The uh, system in Boston had, um, you know, already been pretty progressive. The system for awarding cannabis licenses in Boston, you know, basically gave half of them to equity applicants. And so what happened earlier this year was that Lydia Edwards, one of the U.S. city councils, had proposed a series of sort of further revisions to this. Not all of them have gone through, though. So the one real key reform that she wants to make is she wants to take the ZBA, the Zoning Board of Appeal, out of the process. Mm -hmm. Right now, uh, the way it's set up in Boston is that no one has the right, you know, as of right, they say in some, uh, to build a marijuana store anywhere. You have to go get special permission from the CBA every time. And so even though they have the Boston Cannabis Board, which sort of specializes in these types of businesses and licensing them and reviewing their applications, now you have this other development-oriented body also having to take a look at it. So Lydia Edwards was trying to get rid of that two-step process, get rid of the CBA. Mm. She felt like they were making some arbitrary decisions. Wow, we are seeing a lot of gatekeeping. <laughs> I mean, really, that's uh, if we're trying to take a wider view at what's happened this year, I think this is just another example of how um, folks who are trying to set up cannabis companies uh, and those who are trying to 
live around cannabis companies are having this battle about who should be allowed and where. I wonder how much of the power will stay at the municipal level. Um, I guess it's interesting to watch.